Welcome everyone to this evening Zoom program, My Journey from an Ethiopian Village to Israeli Diplomacy, featuring Deputy Consul General of Israel in Miami, Hassa Bense Harbor. I'm Sharona Whistler, and I serve as the Executive Director for the Zionist Organization of America's Florida Region. I want to give a special welcome to our local and national board members and donors who are with us today, and to all of my colleagues who are on the Zoom. A special thank you to my colleagues who are helping behind the scenes on tonight's call. Alan J, Director of Outreach and Engagement, Steve Feldman, our Executive Director in Philadelphia, Stuart Pavlak, Executive Director in Pittsburgh, and our Communications Manager, Jackie Schaefer. I am so proud and honored to work with such a dedicated ZOA team, not just those who I mentioned, but everyone. Our crucial work in Israel activism and combating against anti-Semitism, be it on college campuses, on Capitol Hill with our government relations department, and in the courts with our Center for Law and Justice is continuously relied upon and our incredible team is tireless. And on a more personal note, I'm proud to represent ZOA because I know we'll always be unapologetic and uncompromising in our Zionism and on behalf of the Jewish people speaking the truth. So I just wanna say that ZOA's voice and all of your voices, involvement, and your financial support on behalf of ZOA is needed and very much appreciated. And on that end, I must thank our current donors, especially our donor society level givers for making all of our work possible. And I encourage those of you who are able, if you haven't made your financial commitment to ZOA this year, it would be, I would be so grateful if you would please consider making your donation early on in the year so you can budget for the greatest impact possible. For tonight, please keep yourselves muted during the program. Um, unfortunately, the technical issue that we had earlier was we couldn't um, enable our chat box feature to allow chat, uh, chat box questions from the audience. Um, so we're gonna be doing a, a Q and A between me and our guest speaker. Um, a, a few months back, you may have tuned in to another Zoom event that was hosted by my colleague, Alan Jay, featuring Rafi Berg, who, um, who's an author. He wrote a, a book called Red Sea Spies, which is the incredible story about the fake diving resort the Mossad set up to secretly bring Ethiopian Jews to Israel. There was also a Netflix film that was inspired by this mission. And I really think there could be an almost endless series that we could do of incredible and inspiring stories from the Jews of Ethiopia. And it's a huge honor for me to be facilitating this program tonight. I was going to say that I've had the privilege of getting to know our speaker these last couple of years, but I need to add to that because I know it's been a privilege for all of us here in Florida, certainly for me and for ZOA, it has been. Hasa Bense Harbour came to Miami in March of 2019 to assume the role as Deputy Counsel General at the Israeli Consulate in Miami. Previously, she served as the Deputy Head of Mission at the Israeli Embassy in Wellington, New Zealand. And before, be and before being assigned to New Zealand, she served as the Deputy Head of Mission at the Israeli Embassy in Yangon, Myanmar. Hasa holds a MA an MA from Tel Aviv University in the field of public policy and a BA from Hebrew University in the field of international relations and education. She is fluent in Amharic, Hebrew, and English. Hasa, thank you for spending this time with us. It's truly an honor to have you with us this evening. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Sharona. Thank you, Sharona. It's great to be with you here. Uh, I apologize in advance if you hear some babies uh, <laughs> uh, voices in the background. Uh, the kids are still awake, uh, but I'll do my best while I'm rocking my uh, six month old baby in his uh, <laughs> stroller. Um, I'm really happy to be here with you. Uh, we have been plan trying to plan this for a long time and then I was on our maternity leave and it's great to be back. Uh, and uh, Sharona, it's 
really a great pleasure working with you. Um, uh, you you guys are doing such an amazing job. Um, you know, in addition to our you know regular diplomatic work, you're doing a lot a lot of uh, work that you know helping the state of Israel uh, keeping up with everything that's going on and to make sure um, there is a great support to the state of Israel and the, to the Jewish uh, state. So we really appreciate uh, your work. And more than that, we're really happy to work together. Um, and uh, it's really great uh, and a pleasure. Um, it's uh, funny, it's to, towards, you know, next week is Passover and we talk about, you know, my journey and, you know, our journey, the Ethiopian Jewish community is considered as the second uh, Yetziat Mitzrayim, the, the exodus from uh, Egypt. Um, and um, in, in a way, in a way, it's truly uh, like that, uh, because, you know, when I was a, a child in Ethiopia, in the village, mind you, when I say village, is like a far gone village, you know, I, I can share with you maybe um, a, a slideshow just to show you how the village looks like. Um, maybe I'll do it while I'm talking. Um, it's like no, no rainwater, no electricity. It's just a village, you know, farm a village. And we grew up in, um, as a community in a sense of, we are the only left, uh, you know, um, Jewish beta Israel. We call ourselves beta, beta Israel because we are part of, of Israel. And mind you, Israel is to be Israelis, the Hebrews is to be 12 tribes. And uh, we, we are from the tribe of Dan. Um, and and uh, our tradition is uh, exactly how it used to be in the in the temple. And and growing up, it's like it's being next year in in Jerusalem. Every prayer, every morning, that was the prayer. That's where I grew up. Um, even though, like, I mean, I look the same like every Ethiopian uh, person in Ethiopia. Uh, but we were very uh, separated and um, a unique community. Um, and uh, actually. What kept us our identity for a long time is the, the faith. Is the faith that one day uh, God of Israel, Elohe Israel, will answer our prayer and will be back to Jerusalem. And um, you know, God knows what you know. I was lucky to to be back to Jerusalem in my in my generation, uh, which is really incredible after thousands of years of, of uh, prayer. Um, and for me, um, just you know, on a short, to be a diplomat for the state of Israel, it's uh, it's a dream come true. So um, yeah, um, so it's I grew up in a house that is very much a public servant. And my grandfather, it's, uh, God bless his memory, he was kind of Rambam. I don't know if you you know he made he made medicine by plants. He uh, created uh, a prayers, you know, he, he wrote books. So our house actually was open to the public, which means it doesn't matter if you are Christian or Muslim. So everyone came to my grandfather's house to ask for pray. It's funny, even the Muslim or the Christian, they came, you know, to our house to say, uh, you know, Alec as Solomon. Solomon was my grandfather's name. Alec has been an honorary name that you're adding, you know, so Mr. Solomon, it's Alec as Solomon. They would say, can you please tell us when is the right time to, to take this journey? Uh, can you say some prayer, someone in our family is sick? You know, the, it's really not only that, he made like a necklace or, or uh, a bracelet uh, from a prayer from the Torah to the people so they can carry it. You know, like we call it like mezuzah or the tefillin, that we, that's, that's what we used, uh, we, uh, my grandfather used to do. So I grew up in a very uh, tradition, traditional uh, house um that uh kept all the you know tradition um uh even today you know it's funny on on shabbat uh our community we don't eat something hot in on shabbat because shabbat is shabbat you're not supposed to cook anything on shabbat and you don't even eat something hot on shabbat just to make sure that won't be seems like you cook it on shabbat even today in israel uh you know, even though we have all the technologies, uh, you know, uh, still my my mother she never eats something hot uh, on Shabbat. The food has to be cold. Um, and in that environment that I grew up in, uh, in in a, in, a, in a Zionist environment uh, um, uh, that I grew up in, 
that's you know what made me who I am today. In addition to many uh, many um, uh, you know other influence in, in in my life, including Camp Rama, I was just I was just telling to <laughs> Steve uh, uh, about it. Um, so uh, when the journey, you know, when we found out, you know, more than 100 years about, uh, you know, the, the French Jews came to, um, to to search about those falasha, you know, we we known in the world as a falasha because um, although we had a connection a long time ago, um, in the modern time, 100 years ago, we known as a falasha for the European Jewish community because that's how the Christian missionary came with when they come to who convert to Christianity, most of the Ethiopian. So they found out a group of people that were resisting them. So they went back to Europe telling their Jewish fellows. And that's how our name as a Falasha, actually it's it's not a nice name, Falasha. But if someone will call me Falasha now, Falasha means you know invader, someone who doesn't belong to the, the country, which means to Ethiopia. Someone will call me Falasha, I won't get offended. But if, it, if Ethiopia, some, in Ethiopia someone call me Falasha, which means you don't belong there, you're a foreigner and this kind of thing. So um, the the modern co connection um, made it you know significant um, uh, to our uh, knowledge and and when we started the big journey in my family my extended family started the journey individuals since 1956 actually uh, and the big journey this, uh, was in uh, you know. Um, um, the Moses operation when people walked from Ethiopia to Sudan literally walked. Um, lost life. Uh, many of you are, you know, known this uh, this story, including my mother's twin sister who never made the journey. Uh, she died on the way in Sudan. Uh, when that started in 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 Ethiopia, my grandfather said, you know, he was kind of natural karta. He was, it's not ready. You know, it, God is not ready. God didn't say so. He cannot force uh, to go to Israel. You have to wait until we see the sign. And when, you know, he was very, you know, anti going to Israel, working to Israel. And he said, a lot of people will die. It's not the time. Then, then the village started to be empty. So we can't really be alone in the village. And then later on, my, uh, my parents and my siblings and my, grandfa my grandfather, um, uh, we moved to, to, from our village to Addis Ababa, the capital. And then from Addis Ababa, uh, we met the journey in 1991, uh, where between the, the second big operation was in May 1991, and we came in January 1991 for the end of the Gulf War. You can imagine to come to Israel and to receive a gas mask. Um, and um, when we uh, arrived at the, in that time, they paid a lot of money, the state of Israel paid a lot of money to Mangistu al Maram, the communist regime of Ethiopia back then, uh, to send families uh, to, to Israel um, until the biggest second operation in 1991. Uh, so uh, the journey, you know, I, as a child, I was not really, no one told me anything where we're going, uh, where, because they said kids, they cannot keep secrets. So it has to be a secret. Like we printed that we're visiting uh, families in Addis Ababa, and the people that we trusted, we told them, like my parents telling me that after we arrived to Israel. Uh, but uh, as a child, you know, you're going somewhere, you don't, like you have no say, you can't ask questions. Um, and uh, only when we arrived to Israel, even when I arrived to Israel, I didn't really believe uh, that we are in, in the holy city, in on the holy land in, in Jerusalem, because in our imagination, what we remember is the, the um the temple and everything was gold and as everyone's keeping shabbat and and it was very different from uh our tradition which is more likely the biblical tradition um so that was a big surprise for me um and not only that but also to see white people that are part of my tradition and my people that was a great mutual uh, learning um so i think uh uh, it was really incredible, uh, and one of the things I, I'll tell you, we live in Ramle. In Ramle, there's a great Jewish, you know, the community, and you know, no, no, the Jewish um, Israelis from all backgrounds. Uh, so what we, what my favorite thing is, uh, you know, to visit the synagogues because I was so curious. How come, you know, those people not doing keeping the tradition like we do? 
which is very close to what used to be in the in the in the temple. So what my favorite thing to do on Yom Kippur and Ramle is to visit to do synagogue hop. So to visit the Moroccan Jews synagogue, the Indian Jews synagogue, the Yemeni Jews synagogue, um, the Ashkenaz Jews synagogue, you name it, there are so many of them. And to see like in the highest holiday, high, how they, you know, they dress up, how they celebrate it. So um, it was really um, an amazing moment. It's something that is really shaped my, um, you know, my identity as well and connect to the people. Um, like I said, it was a mutual uh, learning. <laughs> yeah, so if you have some questions, I will answer them. Um, so. Sharona, can, I can hear you, you're muted. Okay, okay, yeah. great. now? Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, while I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with a few questions and as an alternative to um, uh, the chat box that we usually use, but we don't have, this is for all of our, our audience, you can send your questions to, you can email them to aj, that's a-j-a-y at z-o-a dot org. And I'll say it again, a-j-a-y at z-o-a dot org. If you have a question, that's what we're gonna do. Okay, so it, your, your parents, there really weren't any discussions around your family's decision to take part in this is Aliyah operation. So, um, because as you say, kids, kids have trouble keeping secrets and I would agree that's true. So where did your parents tell you you were going? They, uh, in, when we arrived to Addis Ababa, mind you, it was chaos because at the time the communist regime of Mangisto Ale Marian uh, toward 1991, it was about to fall, you know, to fall. It was chaos in, in, in the village, and I mean, in Addis Ababa, in the capital. So when they told me, like, we're just gonna go visit a family, and also, you know, like, you're a child, you're not supposed to ask questions, just do whatever we tell you, we are your parents. Um, that's that's the, the, the way it was. We're not really out to ask questions. You know, of course, you know, as a child, you go up praying to go back to Jerusalem, you see a bird and say, you know, bird, tell us the story about Jerusalem uh, or, or something like that, you know, yearning to this um, and the imagination. But eventually when the journey started, I, I didn't know where we're going. We are not even allowed to say. When we arrived at Addis Ababa, actually uh, one of the, uh, you know, Mossad people who worked in, in Addis Ababa approached us because they knew exactly where families are because the Ethiopian community, we knew each other. Not only that, uh, we counted seven generations back before we get married just to make sure we don't have any blood related. So we knew, everyone knew everyone and the families. Um, uh, it's funny because when I, um, when I introduced my family to my husband, Philip, who's, who's Ashkenaz Jew from Ohio, I told my parents, you know what? One thing is for sure, you don't need to count seven generation back. <laughs> so uh, uh, that person recognized us in this, you know, in Addis Ababa and, uh, you know, helped us to do the whole uh, uh, operation. So it's, um, so no, I did not ask any question. And when we arrived, uh, I was still, for me personally, it was very weird uh, to get gas mask, to get chocolate. I was like, we never had that kind of thing sweet. We had only sweet from um, uh, the market that my mother used to, in, in the village, used to go. My mother, she was expert in uh, making uh, um, ceramic dishes. She sold them in the market, uh, and that's how we made a living, in, in, in addition to what my grandfather did. Um, and uh, in that market, used to buy us candy, you know, the candy, the hard, you know, carrot candy. And what we did is took that candy, put it in a, in a, in a lime and a lemon and to make lemonada. That's how we, that's, that's the sweetest thing that we, we did. And to come to, you know, to Israel to receive chocolate was really, uh, uh, really, uh, I did not like that at, at the beginning, but no. <laughs> but it, it's just um, uh, from my perspective right now that I know, to make the journey in those time of the when the communist regime is falling, and you know, imagine you leaving the the, the village 
walking, walking to the big city next, ne uh, next door um, and to take a bus and still to keep silence, you know, you rec they recognize us that we are Falasha. For, you know, they, they can tell. We can tell who's Falasha and who's not. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, a miracle itself just to arrive to Addis Ababa, okay? Um, that was a, a, a miracle mm -hmm. a, itself, you know, in my, not, let alone the journey uh, through Sudan. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the person who wrote the book, uh, The Diving uh, Resort, mm -hmm. Uh, the Red Sea Diving Resort, it's the operation itself, it's a, it's a miracle, it's amazing. Because, you know, it's in those camp, refugee camps, there were only, not only our community, many, many people because of the war and because of the communist regime in, in, in Ethiopia. So how you find those families, how, you know, it's, it's really an amazing, amazing thing, things that have done. Uh, the state of Israel and and uh, have, so um, uh, the journey itself it's it's uh, you know it's different it's uh, but also the survival part of it so you can imagine we we approaching Passover the journey that they did Bnei yeah. Israel in, in, in Passover well, we spoke about that yeah, yeah. The week and it's it really is just it's such a it's remarkable it's such a physical journey and mm -hmm. and actually trekking and walking and it just it must have felt I mean I would imagine that it felt like living the Torah even though you didn't know where you were going but now looking back knowing that you were coming to to Israel um yes and and for for us you know you know walking barefoot and uh, uh, you know, it's natural because that's what that was. But uh, when I look uh, at it back, it was uh, it, it, it was really uh, a heroic thing to do because we believed it like the faith itself. We were working like Bnei Israel did, like Moses took Am Israel from Egypt. That's the way we're going to walk to Eretz Israel, to Jerusalem. Um, and I don't know if you know. Of also, as a people, not just yeah. individually, but as a whole. Yeah. Because that community, the community that kept us very close to each other, that's how uh, we, uh, you know, I, I, I believe that Judaism it's, it exists because the community. It can't be Jew by yourself. It's not just like that we need 10 people in a minion to pray because the, the community protect the individual and the individual protect the community. So being a Jew means you have to have a community. You cannot be a Jew just, you know, by yourself. <laughs> that's not... Uh, that's not how it works in in, in general. So uh, the community was a, had a strong say in time of uh, crisis. Our rabbis the case and protect us and the community. Um, yeah, that's that's just you know me. I'm just giving a, a really a tiny example of my family. How my grandfather uh, Alec Solomon he protected the community by writing books, being nice to the neighbors, give them medicine. And my, and my mother, she kind of, she was the pharmacist finding the, the special plants. Um, it, it was very important for him to keep um, in peace with our neighbor. Even when there were weddings, they will give us uh, the sheep and say, Solomon, can you please slaughter it the way you do it and join us, you know, we eat, we don't even drink water from them, from the Christian community or the Muslim community, but we join the celebration by cooking our food, drinking from our own dishes and everything, but we joined the celebration. That was uh, 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 the way we lived. At the same time, we had, there are some, you know, not pleasant times where, you know, they called us Falasha and those kind of things were, uh, were not pleasant. So the faith uh, that, uh, a, a, our ancestors, God, Elohe Israel, will take us back to Jerusalem. That's what kept us for a long, a long time. Um, I just want to bring you back and I just want to show you a picture. Um, so can you see this picture? So this is a picture of Ben Gurion uh, lighting Hanukkah candles in Burma, back then now it's known as Myanmar. I'm sure you heard of Myanmar in the news lately. So that's Ben Gurion in the early 60s, lighting Hanukkah candles uh, with the Jewish community and local leaders um, in Burma. Back then, there was a great Jewish community that came from Iraq and Iran. Uh, they were traders, uh, you know, in Southeast Asia. Some of them came with the uh, with the British people. Um, and see this Hanukkah, the menorah. Okay, many years later, I 
a diplomat of the state of Israel, me and my husband, Philip, came to as a diplomat to Yangon, Myanmar, Burma. And uh, we did, uh, we made a reception to the, you know, Jewish people, a young leadership and Hanukkah reception. And we lighted candles with the same Hanukkah, the same menorah that Ben Gurion did um, uh, in, the, in the 60s. Uh, you know, it's just showing you, um, it's amazing by itself that I'm showing you those two pictures, Ben Gurion lighting Hanukkah candle with the same Hanukkah, you know, the highlighted candle with the same Hanukkah that Ben Gurion did, uh, the continuation and the faith. And, and, um, and I am so uh, grateful and humbled to continue the work of the Ben Gurion and, and other Zionists uh, being a diplomat for the state of Israel. Uh, and this is all because of uh, our faith. Um, our, you know, like the Emuna, it's, there is no other way to explain it. It's just the faith that one day we'll go back to, to Jerusalem and uh, we'll continue our, our work. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, before I get to the to the audience questions, because we do have we do ha have some of those, um, I just wanted to ask what what did you hear, if anything, from um, from other Ethiopian Jews, and you said you had a lot of family members actually who had gone to Israel in previous operations. What did you hear from them from Israel, if anything? Yeah, I, you know what? It's a great question because while I was in the village, they were, they're not, they were, they didn't tell us much of what's happening there. But on Passover, we received matzot that came from Israel. I remember that, and I wasn't sure to eat it or not because it's not the same matzah that my grandmother made. Because my grandmother made it the way the the Bnei Israel did it right when they before they left, uh, you know, the night they left uh, Egypt. Uh, and I wasn't sure what is that, this, you know, kind of cracker. And I was like, I wasn't sure if to eat it or not. And then when I saw my grandfather eating it, I say, okay, then it's kosher, I can eat it. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, there were connections, there were letters. Uh, even they managed to bring us uh, matzot from Israel to the village. Um, again, as a child, you know, I was not allowed to ask questions because, you know, kids chat. So. You know, and if they talk about the journey or what's going to happen, what's going on in Israel, they always tell us, you know, to go to bed or to, you know, they talk outside while we stayed inside uh, inside the house. Um, but um, of course, they told us the story of uh, everything is, you know, beautiful, perfect. You know how you um, draw a picture to a child uh, that's, and then we wanted it so 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 much, um, and. Um, of course, the reality is way different from what <laughs> was uh, described to us. Um, but uh, everything was ha hush hush, you know, quiet. Um, and uh, when the villages started moving on and it started being empty, then we had, you know, just you know to go um, and this kind of things. So, um, so it's like it's not really preparing. I, I didn't even say goodbye to my friends uh, when we left. You know, so it's not really, there was no really preparing. We just, I just took the clothes that I had. They said, we're going to go visit family in Addis Ababa. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's it. <laughs> that's, uh, I, I, I even remember, you know, when, you know, the one of the things about the communist regime in Ethiopia, uh, the, you know, Mengistu El Maria made sure that they were, will, they were, will go and teachers will go to the villages to teach uh, reading and, uh, and writing. And as a Falasha kid, when we had to go, they forced the parents to send us. It's not like, oh, there's a school. If you want, you can send your kid. No, you have to send your kid. Uh, and my experience as a child going to school uh, was not a pleasant one. I didn't want to go to school because it was horrible for me. Uh, because they call us, the kids call us Falasha. Uh, they were, you know, uh, throwing stone on us, <laughs> those kind of things. Uh, but that was the, the, the reality. And not only that, on um, uh, the market, mind you, my mother used to sell her uh, ceramic dishes in the market. Uh, I remember um, the market used to be on Sundays, but we obviously we can't sell anything on Shabbat. Uh, and they turned it that the market will be on Saturday. And it was a point that we were starving because we couldn't sell anything, uh, our products, because it was on Shabbat. And Shabbat, you starve, you, you know, you don't break Shabbat. That's that's the rule. Um, 
and only people that knew my mother they came to our house to to buy the the dishes uh, and that's how uh, we survived but there were so many changes that happens in the, in the communism era that happens that you know led us almost to starvation um, in addition to what was happening in, in the famine in, in Ethiopia and those kind of things um, but um, yeah I think the the fact that my grandfather was you know smart knowledgeable person uh, helped a lot in our survivor in our community in our village um, yeah so it's um, so you know the prey um, never ended and the work of um, my um, my grandfather you know behind the scene with the leadership of the uh, the Christian community or the Muslim community that's in our village what's helped us uh, survive you know and even it's it's funny uh, the story of um, how a uh, Moses met Zipporah uh, in the well how uh, you know in the Bible uh, they met each other in the well you know it's hard met <laughs> Uh, Rivka in the, in the well, and, and, and Jacob too, he <laughs> met Rachel in, in the well. So, so the well was a, in, in a, a main place where everything happens because you're waiting for the water to come up, um, and then um, you slowly, be, you know, take waters before, you know, without mixing with the mud. Um, and that's how we used to bring water from the well. And, oh, that's a nice. <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, there were times that my, you know, my mother used to carry the water, the water can on her back, and there were times that uh, she used to come back with a wet back because the, someone threw stone on her and, and broke the, the water can. Uh, there were times like that. So, um, you know, but um, with all those ups and downs, uh, like I said, our faith was the strongest one. And, uh, you know, the, just the fact that I'm here having this conversation with you uh, it's a miracle itself for me and the way i see it and I i'm seeing my life back in ethiopia yeah <laughs> i i think so too really incredible did your grandfather um end up coming with you when you went he was finally ready to go to israel and said it was okay my grandfather eventually came because you know again the village was uh, empty um and he um he came to Israel um, and he passed away in Israel. Uh, it's funny because when we arrived, there was no synagogue for our community because uh, our prayer is from, you know, the Orit. Orit means the Orita in Aramic, and that's how we called our Torah. And we read it like a book, and it wasn't written in a language called Gez. So if someone understands Aramaic and, uh, and Arabic and, and, and Hebrew, could understand uh, the Gez. Uh, he wrote so many books, and on the way they were stolen. Even in Israel, someone stole the book, his books. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some thief that thought there is money in it or something like that. Um, so when we didn't have synagogue, he would go to the Moroccan uh, synagogue. He didn't understand anything. Uh, he didn't understand Hebrew or anything. Uh, he was just, you know, sitting there and praying like everyone. When they stand, they see. He, sta he stood, and when they sat, he he sat. And and and, uh, and I used to walk, go with him every Saturday morning uh, to the synagogue. Every Saturday morning, uh, yeah, he's <laughs> his memory should always have a blessing, Casa. Thank you for, for yeah. telling us about him. Yes. Um, this is this is a question um, from from one of our uh, ZOA Florida board members, and I think I've seen it from other people who you know, Paul Cruz. <laughs> He asked if you could talk about the, the challenges uh, in, a, in adapting for you and for your parents, cultural, um, friends, language, school, and, and what that was like. Uh, so when we came to, uh, to, to Israel, mind you, we came uh, totally from a different uh, culture. Uh, I just want to show there is, if there is a, a way that I can show you another one. Um, uh, slideshow of the picture of the village. Uh, we came from a totally different background, which, which means that uh, no electricity, no running, no running water, and, and definitely totally different culture. Um, and uh, I will share now the screen so you will see someone draw a picture of the village from its, its memory. Um, can you see this? 
So that was the village of, that was our village, okay? The memory, and that's how I remember it. Uh, this is the Beth Mekdes, now we say Mekdes is Mekdash, the place that you pray. And this is a woman in terms of Nida every month, you know, a woman that was not allowed, when in the time of the, of the temple, women were not allowed uh, to go uh, uh, to the temple if she's in time of a puberty. So what we did is to really to give a woman once a month for seven days of vacation. I will take it now today as well. Uh, and why we surrounded this with stone, just to make sure what's from, you can sit here and talk to her, but you're not allowed to pass the stone. The words to pass, you pass the stone, you're not pure anymore and you have to go to a waterfall to be clear, uh, clean, I mean, to be pure, to have the blessing my, my, my grandfather, and then you go to the to the house. So everything's taking, taking care for, uh, for her. This is the power of community. For seven days, a woman can sit in this house, uh, and everything is made for her. The community took care of everything. And this is the water carrier that I was talking about when my mother was bringing water from the well. And this is the Mankala game that we used to uh, play in Ethiopia. And so when I found it in, uh, in, in Walmart, I was so surprised. <laughs> that, that was funny. Um, so, so we came from this environment of no electricity, no, no language. Just We thought that we are the only beta Israel that left uh, from the 12 tribes to come to the modern world is totally shock, okay? A shock for my parents. So what does that mean to come with children, with young children to a new country that you don't know this, the, the culture, you don't know the language, and you, you, know, you don't even know the, the daily basic things that you need to manage, the banking, the uh, you know, cooking in, 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 in electricity or in the stove. Those kind of things were new. So what the greatest thing that the state of Israel did is to put us in observation center uh, until we learn the modern life and uh, and then we can move on, um, uh, you know, buying or uh, renting in our home in a different uh, place and, and to move on. But it's not enough uh, because there is the shock uh, to come to a new country, bringing your kids to something that you didn't know, the reality. And what's that mean to raise a kid? in this reality where you don't know the culture, you don't know anything. So the children, me we, uh, and my siblings, we learn the, the language faster, which means that we were the eye and the map of our parents. I was, my job as, a, as the older daughter of my family, my job was to take care of my family. My job was to, to make sure that my little siblings, they will stay out of trouble and they will stay in school. I'm, I was the one who chose the school for my, my siblings. I didn't know that if the school is good or not. I know that it was close to home, okay? Um, it means to, to take my parents and my grandparents to running errands to the bank, uh, to the you know healthcare, uh, to the doctor, a, every running errands for them. Uh, that was my job. I was holding the household or, uh, you know, um, of seven people including, and, and also nine, 10 uh, people, including my grandparents. Uh, to make sure that everything is is done for them, and and if they need the translation, to translate for them, uh, that was I, that's what I did for a long time. Uh, even serving in the army, I had to tell my commander that I have to leave uh, on Sunday. I cannot come back to the camp because my grandfather needs me, or my mother needs me to go to the bank or to run errands for them. So our commanders didn't understand what's that mean that you need to run errands for your parents, but your parents they can do that. No, they can't do that. Um, so there are a lot of clashes with my commanders trying to explain to them. So that was the challenge to be a parent. And you can only imagine, you imagine you as a, you know, some of you for, as a parent, not to be able to educate your kids, to tell them what's good and what's not, to give them advices, or to talk to them about the future, where they're going to study, what they're going to study. There was no something like that in my house. I grew up in a very educated uh, environment with my grandfather and everything. But when we came in Israel, they were depends on me. Uh, I think it's just uh, you know God's way of protecting me for you know staying away of uh, from trouble and to become what I become. Um, uh, but you know if you see a lot of crisis of young Ethiopians in the crime and all those kind of things. That's because of the, this kind of crisis. The parents cannot help these children, these children, and it's the opposite side. It's 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 against the nature <laughs> uh, that the parents cannot help the children. 
um, that was the main, main, main challenge. In addition, uh, the fact that there is no this called Mergam Gojo. In Ethiopia, we know how to, 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 uh, to celebrate our tradition according to what used to be in the Torah and the Bible in, in, in the, when, the, um, when the temple was existing. And coming to Israel and to see that you cannot celebrate the way you do or to keep Nida or uh, you know, pure or non pure, uh, uh, the basic thing, the, the foundation of, the, of our tradition was a huge crisis. And the fact that our Kesim, our leader, could not marry us, that was a crisis. So my grandparents, they didn't even eat any meat in Israel until the day, the day they passed away, OK? So which means that they, they was not kosher enough if people not keeping Shabbat or Nida was, was not enough. It was not kosher enough. So until the, even my mother, she's, until today, she doesn't touch any meat. So uh, with all this you know, language, uh, a culture, and every immigrant has it, in addition, you come to the Jewish state and basically you don't do what you used to do in Ethiopia, keeping in your tradition, what kept us for thousands of years, that was a huge crisis, okay? So um, the, the reason that I'm doing uh, synagogue hope uh, in Ramle on Yom Kippur when I was in Israel is to learn this because we were so disconnected from each other for thousands of years uh, and it's not like that the Moroccan Jews, they have their own synagogue, the Yemenite Jews, the Indian Jews, the, um, you know, uh, the Iranian Jews, they have their own, so each one has his own synagogue because we were so separated and we didn't have something that used to unite that was, was the temple, okay? Um, and for me to learn this was so important for me, so fascinating for me. Um, and, and yeah, so it's just the crisis is just double and double. <laughs> Yeah. Um, has it has it improved at all? And and also there's a, a follow up question about how you were able to overcome these really serious challenges growing up and to become where you are now and so successful and and, and inspirational. Oh, thank you. Um, I think uh, my grandfather. I was always he didn't, even though he did not know anything in Hebrew, he did not understand he still went to a synagogue because, you know, he said, those are part of Bnei Israel, you know, part of people of Israel, even though we don't know them, we don't understand their language, but he felt it and he really like, he, he was full of faith. Uh, his leadership to me was, um, you know, was incredible in his education. I was very close to him, very, very close to him. I used to wake up 5 a.m. in the morning, 4 a.m. in the morning to pray with him. So he was a huge influential for me. Uh, um, and um, to overcome this, I think uh, the people that I met in Israel and also the help of the state of Israel, the education system, um, uh, and the people that I met in the army, uh, which they uh, you know, exposed me to, exposed me, I mean, they opened my eyes to the possibility to go after the army to Camp Ramai, the Poconos, and to teach Hebrew. So I'm the Ethiopian uh, immigrant going to America, teaching Hebrew at the Jewish camp in, in the Jewish community. Um, that was the, uh, a great learning moment for me, uh, great community, really, it was really a life-changing experience because uh, in that community, I learned that also women can read in the Torah, while in my community, I don't even allow to touch the Orit, <laughs> not alone to read it. So that was a, a life-changing moment and meeting a, a lot of Shlichim, Israelis and, uh, on that mission uh, at camp and learning you know, from their life experience and they were, what they are planning to do. I, I just followed my friends in, 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 to the university and I, uh, it just happened to me, they were good friends. Uh, and um, yeah, that's how I ended up at Hebrew University. Um, but um, it's, it's a lot of, uh, a, when you are in this situation where you need to, to, to pave your own path uh, and your parents cannot help you because the given situation, you just pray, uh, or every parent's pray is that they will, he, the, the children will find good people to lead them to good places uh, because they cannot help these, the, their children. And there are many cases of you know, young, young people uh, that will turn to crime or other things. Uh, but thank God, uh, uh, a lot of young, other young people, there are many educated uh, people, they, they pursue academic levels, uh, really, uh, the leadership, 
uh, that those are the new uh, uh, leaders of our community and teaching the young people and being a role model uh, to them, even though the parents, you know, they don't know anything, but that you, you see other uh, people, you can ask questions and uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, this is a, a question from one of our national board members, Len Getz. Um, can you elaborate more on the difference between how you imagined Israel and the reality when you first arrived? Um, when you, you mentioned that you expected going to Israel, you expected to see uh, the Beit Hamikdash. Um, yeah. You know, maybe you had seen like there were pictures, or that was what your vision was for um, in about about Israel. So um, did you, I mean, were you aware that the, the Beit HaMikdash would not be there? Or is that the way you thought about it just as a child? I wasn't aware that the Beit HaMikdash wasn't there. Um, because as a child, you grew up, one day we'll come back, you know, we will come back to do the sacrifices, you know, uh, Passover is coming and Passover is one of the, the holidays that, uh, you know, you have to go to Jerusalem three times a, a year and uh, on Passover is one of them. And, and, you know, you're expecting to go, uh, but it's different and they mess everything made by gold. Um, and those kind of things. Uh, my, my parents, my grandfather, he knew, uh, but they didn't never told us again, because you know, you want your kids to keep dreaming big and <laughs> achieving. Um, so uh, the, the difference is uh, pretty, uh, was pretty clear. Uh, but when you arrived in, in you are in a mode of surviving, you don't really think what were my dream, you, you're thinking about how I can, uh, you know, survive the next day, helping my parents, helping, you know, my mother uh, to, to cleaning offices so we can, you know, have uh, food on the table and those kind of things. That's what you think, how to keep my, my little siblings out of trouble. You don't really have time to, to, to do reflection. Now, now maybe I have <laughs> while talking with you, uh, but, um, you know, it seems like, you know, here advocating for Israel, being a diplomat for Israel, um, is uh, you know what Israel hearing about you know what are people hearing about Israel and what they think about Israel and what's the reality itself it was kind of like this kind of thing uh, I, I I face it a lot here I, I, not only here even when I was in Myanmar Burma uh, and in New Zealand uh, as part of my job you know you know even you know stand it up and saying something I'm saying my name is Kasa and I'm the diplomat for the state of Israel and there are people that are, what. <laughs> you're not you're not working for the UN or something. You are a diplomat for the state of Israel. Uh, those kind of things are uh, surprising that uh, you know I, I can see. Uh, but in those you know yes, it's surprising. It's just different. It's complicated. Uh, but you don't have time for this. You 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 need to move forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, are th is there any semblance of a Jewish community left in, in Ethiopia? Um, is there would there still be um, a, a need for 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 an aliyah? For so, what happens uh, right now? It's uh, the community that's left right now. It's called uh, Falashmura. So Falashmura, imagine it was like the um, when the Spanish Inquisition happened in 300 years ago, and some of the a lot of them converted to Christianity, and that's how the the Falashmura are. A lot of them uh, uh, converted for many reasons converted to Christianity and now they want to come back mm -hmm. so uh, to the you know to their ancestor tradition so what the state of Israel is doing is the reuniting families and uh, you know really to check who his background was really Jewish and was not um, it's funny because the other day my friend uh, came to me and said he's a Tunisian a Jew from Tunisia mm -hmm. and he said you know uh, my 300 years ago my ancestors uh, they were uh, you know um, kicked away from Spain and now we can return as a Spain uh, citizens if we want to. Uh, this kind of things that, uh, you know, I see it the same kind of, um, and now they want to come back and, and, and you know, why not? So they're still uh, making Aliyah. Uh, Pnina, our minister of uh, Aliyah and Observation, she's, uh, you know, doing a great job as well. And that, the, you know, the government of Israel doing a great job in bringing those families and checking the background mm -hmm. and, uh, to do the reconversion to Judaism and and uh, and uh, bring bring them back, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, this is a, a question from another one of our national board members, Cheryl Silver, about your unique position as a, an Israeli diplomat and as an, an Ethiopian Jew um, about um, being able to provide valuable input and unique input um, to the government about helping Ethiopian families improve with the adjustments and about the different Jewish traditions and rituals? Um, well, definitely. Uh, my work here, uh, which is almost everywhere in, in Burma was more, more likely to do, you know, um, a more agri-tech, agri technologists and this kind of thing, agricultural technologists in New Zealand were more, was more high-tech technologists and other, also farming. <laughs> and here, um, I, uh, the work here at, at uh, um, our consulate in Miami was incredible because uh, I did so many uh, things like you know technology, helping uh, Mayor Suarez. Uh, you know he in Miami easily can be uh, the Silicon Valley, the new Silicon Valley, uh, and uh, you know talking with the Mayor Suarez here. Uh, uh, to you know, to share the know-how and the experience of Israel, how to build uh, innovative community, how to bring in startups uh, and uh, and this kind of things. Uh, what Israeli technologies can do, helping elderly in time of COVID uh, and, and bringing Israeli companies like Insight Tech uh, and helping with Alzheimer and those kind of things, uh, sharing the knowledge and technology. At the same time, my political work, working with both. Um, parties and keeping to make sure that Israel is uh, by uh, its support of Israel will be by partisan support, uh, working with both, uh, you know, with both parties. Um, it's, it's uh, I mean, it's surprising people that I'm saying I'm a diplomat for the state of Israel. They are, inter, uh, you know, interested, for example, when I was in Tallahassee last year before COVID hit, um, I was in the, in Tallahassee and the, you know, the, uh, the legislator sit was at the time I was there and I was speaking to the, you know, Black Caucus, I asked for a meeting with the Black Caucus. And, you know, I was, you know, expecting a meeting to, you know, but also a question about uh, uh, Israel and the Palestinians, so all those kind of things. Um, but little they know that the person that will come and stand in front of them will be an Ethiopian Jew, uh, which is really a big surprise. So instead of like talking about Israeli politics and those kind of things, I found myself, uh, a, a, you know, um, telling them the story of my community and Israel, and and, um, and a lot of them were from uh, the Caribbeans and asking about you know my Ethiopian background as the Haile Selassie visited in the in the 60s, the Caribbeans and the Jamaica Jamaica as well, um, and they were so interested to learn uh, because this is not you know accessible for them. They don't find it everywhere. Um, and in addition to that, we end up talking about agriculture technology here and, and uh, how Israel can share the know-how and bringing more technology to, to the farmers here. Um, but it's just a small example how uh, me being there out there uh, raised a lot of questions and, and being curious. Uh, so showing them Israel, it's such a diverse country and there are so many <laughs> Israelis that look like me and they're also different, but, uh, and this is not something that they, they know of and, or they, 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 you know, it's not that they, they you know, they're gonna Google for it. They see and they learn things for whatever they see on the media. And uh, for them was such a learning moment. Uh, and actually I'm, I'm just planning to do a program called uh, like uh, Lion and Zion. Uh, and from Bob Marley songs with the uh, Afro, uh, Afro-Caribbean community here in, in, in Florida, just to teach the connection, you know, uh, to Israel. So a lot of educational, uh, uh, you know, uh, things to do. Uh, I think uh, a lot of things uh, comes from ignorance. And the more we are out there and the more that we educate people, is the, I, I do really believe in education. I, uh, even when I served in the army, I did educational service. So I do believe in education and in teaching people because you know there are a lot of ignorance out there. And sometimes the actions coming out from ignorance and not from, you know, <laughs> that they know and do it on purpose. So, yeah. Um. So it's, it's already eight o'clock, this time really flew by and there was more that I wanted to ask and I know that we had more questions, but I definitely wanna respect your time and just to tell you that you're really a, truly a treasure for Israel 
for all of the Jewish people and thank you for everything that you're doing and, and for, for the time that you, you spent with us this evening. Truly, thank you so, so much. Thank you very much for having me and keep up the great job. Thank you. Before we end, um, I just want to announce uh, that we have an event tomorrow at three o'clock from Iran to the ICC, threats to the and Israel featuring Congressman Lee Zeldin with introductory remarks from ZOA National President Morton Klein, moderated by ZOA's Director of Government Relations, Dan Pollack. Um, and so please be on the lookout for that in your email uh, for, the, for the link. And, um, and, and I also just wanna reiterate that we are such a dedicated group at, at ZOA. And if you're on this Zoom, then I know you wanna help ensure that we're stronger than our enemies. And so thank you again our current ZOA donors, your financial contributions help make this possible. And, but we always have further to go and we have more that must be achieved. So please support us financially as much as you can. And thanks to your support, we will have more of an impact in expanding our crucial work and reaching more people. So please give generously. And as always, to learn more, visit our website, zoa.org, um, or you can email me, florida at zoa.org. And I uh, thank you again so much to everybody here. And thank you again so much, Casa, for being with thank us. You. This was really incredible. Thank you. Hug <laughs>